So just to give, <laughs> take a seat, Glenna in the middle. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me today to talk about innovation with two gentlemen who have a lot of experience in that topic. Uh, Werner, you joined Amazon as a CTO then more than 10 years ago. You have a PhD in computer science. Um, and Amazon in that time has gone through a tremendous change. And I know you are a big driver behind it. And uh, also, um, you're a big contributor here on DoD for many years. Good friend. Thank you. Great to have you here on stage. And a warm welcome. Thank you. And uh, Christopher, you have worked for the Deutsche Telekom for more a decade as chief innovation officer. You had your own startup, which worked very well. And you're now starting at Wimpercom. For all the guys who don't know who Wimpercom is, and I learned that as well, Wimpercom is an international telecommunication company in 14 countries. You have more than 217 million customers, actually. And you are now with your new position you take, I think, this week, right? You Yesterday. start this week. You are the seventh largest integrated telecommunication company in the world. And you have great countries like Russia, Algeria, Pakistan, Ukraine, Laos, Zimbabwe. The only country I'm missing is North Korea. <laughs> But you might say something about that in a few seconds. Um, because Wimpelcom is not well known, could you just say a few words what the business model of the Wimpelcom is and um, what are you doing there? Happy to do so. Well, I only joined yesterday on a Sunday. Uh, my wife was actually shouting at me that I'm starting on a Sunday being an Austrian Catholic with Wimpelcom. Wimpelcom is an unknown beauty in the telecoms arena. It's the seventh biggest, as you said, in the world. It has nearly a quarter of a billion in customers and it's reaching out to a billion people in emerging markets, in essence. These markets are really interesting. You know, it has a Russian heritage. It started there. It is in Italy, uh, going to be a market leader after the transaction with Hutchinson. And, you know, it is serving customers in North Africa, in Asia, in Eurasia, everywhere. And I spent five years of my life now being an entrepreneur in Berlin. I created actually three startups. Two of them are still alive and kicking. One was a failure, so it's a good experience of five years. And I was actually approached to come back to the old telecoms industry, which I had uh, left consciously in 2010 because I thought it's going to die. After 12 years, it's enough. Yeah. I still think so. But this Wimplecom opportunity is unique because that company has really, you know, got it that the telecoms model needs to be radically transformed. And so I listened to the offer and, you know, started there yesterday as the chief digital officer responsible for that digital transformation, but also responsible for the entire commercial business around the globe in these 14 countries. And what is Wimplecom doing different to the big operators on the world, which, you know, was tele telecom? Orange or in America, Verizon and other players, AT&T. What, what, what are they doing differently? Well, let's face it. You have to be clear about your future picture of the industry. And I think uh, telecoms operators tend to be lukewarm and defensive about the future. They had a great grand past. They really served the world in granting Internet access to everybody at the end of the day. But they think they're going to blame their old model going forward. And I think this is, to put it mildly, ridiculous. An operator needs to take a different perspective, and Wimplecom does do that. It clearly realizes that the telecoms model, as we know it, is dead. It is dead. And so the strategy is based on going into a digital future and making a telecoms operator a technology company at the end of the day, which does play in a way that it can serve customers in the future in the digital space. And I think that is the most important foundation I find at Wimplecom doing something different, that radicality in approaching the theme, and that's where it starts. Yeah. We talked last night, and you said you had many talks with the team of Wimpercom, and you already have some ideas about your first steps, what you want to do, uh, the first changes, and anything you can say tonight, here, today? Well, you know, after 24 hours, that is a bit of uh, difficult, of course, uh, to discover all the plans, but what I can say, and we've announced it two days ago with my advent, we're going to open up a new, huge, global, London-based digital division for the company, where we'll drive these digital models. 
think about where we play and really tie into the global ecosystem. And with that division, that will be the springboard, um, if you wish to go there. The second thing is, of course, the task is really to find a new kind of you wish, enabling platform for the model. It is exactly where today iOS and Android is playing. And I think both models are great. I have a lot of respect for that. But they kind of take the consumer relationship away from telecoms operators. And I think that is kind of a little battleground where you will see me acting a little after I have worked also, you know, creating Android with Andy Rubin in the last decade already. OK. Thanks for sharing. It is enormous how Amazon grew. <laughs> I saw the numbers when I prepared here the panel. I read that the number of people working at Amazon in the far last five years grew by 50% per year. And, yep. and Amazon doesn't release any numbers of engineers. It's just the overall numbers. But I think, Werner, even in engineering, probably the growth rate is like that, right? Indeed, yes. Yeah. It's, um... How can you ensure a degree of innovation at Amazon if you grow in such a tremendous speed? Well, I think, first of all, you know, innovation has to be part of your DNA. Yeah, and so it, it is that you have to put both culture, organization, and technology in place to be able to support innovation. Now, and it goes back a long way to, if you look at the letter, that, letter to shareholders that Jeff wrote in 97 when the company went public, uh, on one hand, he really explains this is a company for the long term and things like that, really long term focus in terms of innovation. The second point where he lays out what's the core principles of the company is that we will continuously experiment, measure, and then learn from what we do. And so that's basically the true driver behind all of this. Um, when Amazon started, there was no e-commerce. It didn't exist. So most of many of the areas that we go into is completely unknown ter territory. And the only way to do that is through a tremendous focus of the way that you want to innovate. So, and I mean, our principles is that Amazon wants to be the Earth's most customer-centric company, and that focus on your customers gives you innovation direction. Yeah, yeah. but Werner, I mean, you introduced, Amazon introduced a new product range with AWS, which is a very different business model, which was, if I see the numbers of Amazon, also the stock price, incredibly successful, at least what, what the stock market says, was 100% plus last year. I mean, when, when you say you're customer-centric and we listen to the customer, what happened when you, you people came around and said, we want to introduce AWS, a different model which is not consumer-orientated but more B2B-orientated, when you wanted to introduce it at Amazon? Well, first of all, we had a platform thinking for a long time already. Yeah? I mean, remember, we've gone through many of these phases. Amazon started off as being the only seller on the website. But it became a platform for third parties. And now a substantial part of our, our, our revenue and sales is coming through third party sales. We've opened up our fulfillment centers through a process called Fulfillment by Amazon, yeah, where we're really good at fulfillment. So you can put your goods in our warehouses, and then uh, we'll ship and handle returns for you. You don't even have to sell on Amazon. Yeah? And so Kindle, uh, the ebook e uh, environment, has become a platform for everybody else to sell. So we had a long-term thinking around how to establish platforms without gatekeepers, such that people can truly innovate in this. And AWS wasn't that much different from the other approaches that we've taken. We, again, we are a technology company at heart that I always like to joke happens to do retail. Um, but apply our technology towards the, the, the innovations in, in retail. So we had all of these technologies already internally ready to be used by companies in the outside world to be equally innovative as at Amazon is, where no longer access to compute resources are hindrances to enter a market or to start a business. OK. Can you describe how you organize innovation at the, the part here at WS? How is it working with the thousands of people working for Amazon that you drive out innovation? How is it organized? Well, first and foremost, you have to, as I said earlier, innovation has to be part of your DNA, which means that you hire, again, so it's, all, it's culture. There's a whole culture around Amazon. You should look up the 14 leadership principles that we use to, where we hire against, and where we sort of also perform, we look, look at people's performance against. All of those principles drive around 
customer focus, thinking big, because thinking small is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah? All of this kind of thing, making, being able to do bold decisions. And so you hire people that already have the capability to be independent. Now, so the more structure you put in place in your organization, yeah, the more hindrance to innovation is that you're going to introduce. So we've, we've consciously chosen a decentralized organization with very small teams where each of those teams are responsible for their own level of innovation. How, how large are those teams? About, what are we talking well, it's, about? It, it, it's easiest to see on the retail side. Um, you know, we, we have an architect, service-oriented architecture in place in terms of technology. The, the team structure follows that. So let's say somewhere between 500 to 800 different services, and most of those have an individual team associated with them. Um, so these, and also, but you have to put mechanisms in place as well. So we have a process called working from the customer backwards to make sure that we don't do feature creep and things like that. But we also have a process called the institutional yes. So you must have been in a meeting where someone proposes something new. And there's always somebody else in the meeting, in the room, that says, that won't work. That's not us. That's what we don't do. And as such, the person that proposes something new has to do all the work to convince everybody else. Now, we flipped that around. In our environment, the ones that want to block things have to do all the work. Yeah? That takes care of 95% of the naysayers. It does mean that we sometimes go into alleys or do things that maybe you should not have been doing, but at least we drive experimentation and we learn from the failures that we have in that world. And, uh, I mean, if you talk about failures, one question, Amazon put a lot of efforts behind Amazon's phone. Why did that fail? Well, I think, you know, as, as with everything, you make bold bets yeah, in a bigger long-term strategy. And the, the phone was just one part of that longer term, term strategy. Some of these things will work out, some of them won't. Uh, and I think the most important thing is that you will continue, that you have a willingness to make bold bets and to continue to experiment and then double down on the things that do work well. Uh, and as such, I think there's also, you have to, you have, to be, have a willingness to be misunderstood for a long period of time. Uh, with AWS, people didn't really understand why a retailer would actually build such a computing infrastructure for other students. Those were mostly the people that didn't realize that Amazon was already a technology company. And so, so also, you know, you have to be actually be willing to stick with it. You have to be committed to it. Some, some innovations take a long time to mature. But that means, just to get a clear statement on that, well, Amazon will keep on driving Amazon's in the, phone into the market? No, we continue to have a, no, the, the strategy is a, is a bigger digital strategy around the, the devices. And I think, uh, for example, one of our newest products in that world, the Echo, uh, our voice-assisted uh, voice assisted personal assistant in your home, is tremendously popular. And it's a great success. Some of these things will be great successes and others will not. And as such, you have to double down on the things that really work, work, work well. And I think uh, the whole thing around the Alexa uh, voice service is now becoming a platform that others can integrate into their devices. And uh, there, there may be a range of products coming out uh, in this world. So the things that do work well, you double down on, and others, you make sure that you, you, uh, the, the cost of failure is minimized. OK. So just coming to a totally different topic about entrepreneurs. Today, at least in many countries, young people don't like to work, let's say it differently, young, very ambitious people with excellent university results or even not, don't like to work for consultancy companies anymore. If you talk to the recruiters there, they have a lot of problems to get, to get uh, world-class people. And also, they don't like to work for large companies anymore. They start their own setup company. If you see here in this country, many people who come out of the best universities, they really want to start. And if I say Boda Digital, the people we really lose, sometimes who put themselves, they really start their own company. How do you attract those kinds of highly ambitious, highly energy-driven people who really make a difference to the world as large corpor corporates or as startup companies? You want to start, Christoph? Of course. You know, well, that is a reality. You know, uh, the millennials, um, they have a different direction, which I think is a very good direction. We are past the 80s of the last century, you know, where everybody wanted to work for Goldman Sachs or McKinsey. And um, I think they, people want to work for a greater cause. 
Now, a startup is one option. I do still see a lot of young people, you know, uh, wanting to work for Google and Apple or even uh, com companies like a Wimplecom, who in their markets is the most admired brand sometimes, you know, before Google and others. So I don't see that as a monotrend. But clearly, the entrepreneurial stuff and the new process way of, you know, really uh, pursuing innovation is there. And that's why big corporates have to change their environment. The way we invite people to work with us, the degree of freedom which they have, the way they can fail or succeed in projects, the, the way they can really, you know, define their career, they, the way they, you know, get used to different processes than the old incumbent processes, the way they get also financial support for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial ideas inside the company, spin out or spin along, things like that. So, in essence, that is the model of open innovation. That is no secret. You know, Henry Chesper coined that term 2003. And it is a reality, you know. A company in itself cannot own all the talent around the globe. That is impossible. You have to open up and change the inside of a company as well. Anna, with the thousands of processes American companies have, how do you attract well, I think, I think if I, I mean, we don't have that much of a problem attracting young, talented engineers and, and business people. Why not? Because we are, everybody on the outside can see how fast charging Amazon still is in terms of its process. And we're not going to let up there any, any time soon. Uh, mostly because it's pure a matter of survival. Uh, if you look at um, the past millennium, uh, the, no, the past uh, 100 years, 75% um, of the uh, S&P 500 had disappeared. Yeah, the, um, the last, the lifetime of a company in the early of the 1900s on, on the S&P 500 was 65 years. It's now 13 years. Yeah? The expectation is that in the coming 10 years, 75% of the S&P 500 will have disappeared. Yeah? And so this whole move to digital transformation, where digital no longer is something that sits on the marketing, but sits everywhere in your organization, underpinning everything, any, every possible process, has to do with purely being able to survive in a world where, in a digital world, where competition is murderous and much easier. The entry to market is completely low. Surviving. Another reason for actually driving the um, digital transformation in large organizations is to be able to attract young talent. Because if I, I, I remember talking to um, uh, some of the folks at Citi, uh, the, the large bank in the, in, in the U US, they say that their security strategy, where if you entered the company, you had to leave your personal phone and your personal tablet behind in the security area and would get a, a, a phone from the company. The whole security strategy sort of inhibited them, the old style strategy, from being able to hire young talent. Who said, if you want to hire the best talent and you want them to work 60 to 80 hours a week for you, you have to let their personal life into their business life. They need to be able to get access to their Facebook or to their WhatsApp or whatever. You can no longer hold these things out. And so, for example, City started to realize that their old style approach was a killer for them to hire new people. And they made a clear decision to the security folks, you just need to make it work, that these people can actually bring their own devices and their own world, their own life, into your, your world. Okay. And if you go through that process, it's, a, it's, it's necessary today to be a digital enhanced company to be able to attract young talent. Okay. Are there any questions out of the forum? Anyone who would like to raise his hand and ask a question? There's one hand. Great. So do we have a mic here? Mike is coming. Hi, my name is Monty from Digital Leaders Ventures. Uh, I'd like, I have a question to Werner. How do you keep the innovation spirit within the company? You've grown so tremendously in the last couple of years, but still are working on the edge of new emerging trends, like the echo artificial intelligence. How do you keep the spirit within the company and keep everybody on these new topics? Well, as I said earlier, I mean, there's, you have to put, first of all, you have to put technology in place. Yeah, you have to make sure that you have mechanisms where it is very easy to start something new and be able to measure relentlessly what you're doing new. But th where the barrier to really starting something is, is very low. But also where the cost of failure, if you don't make it, is actually low as well. That actually drives a lot of innovation first. 
Secondly, you have to put an organizational structure in place that makes it easy. Uh, creating new teams to go after a new, a new idea that you have needs to be, you need to be able to do that with extremely low overhead. And then you need to have hired the right people. It's all about culture. It's all about bringing the right people into the company. And then you have to make sure that if you're successful, you know, you don't fall into the innovator's d d dilemma where you get stuck on what you have already done and only try to amplify that. No, you have to continue to look at where can you improve. Now, we always think about innovation as being something that needs to be radically new. But sometimes, or quite often actually, the best innovation happens in f about things that don't change for your customers. What is, in, for example, in retail will forever be important. You know, uh, how large is your catalog? You know, uh, low pricing, um, fast delivery. All of these kind of areas, if you innovate in that, will benefit your customers forever. And so sometimes innovation is not that sexy. It is really under the covers. But you have to continue to do it. And you do this by building teams with the right structure and with the right culture. Also, by removing much of the, what I would call the reporting structure. Yeah, the, the whole top-down reporting stuff is, is a killer for innovation because suddenly the structure of the organization becomes way more important than the small team moving ahead. Now, Jeff always has talked about something called social co cohesion, yeah? where if a company becomes larger and larger, you, the, the exist, if you're a small company, everybody talks the truth to each other. Yeah? You, you continuously, you tell each other the truth. If the company becomes bigger, suddenly the existence of the groups and the company themselves become more important than the product. Now, we've consciously made sure that these teams are small and decentralized from each other such that that particular process doesn't happen. But it's something that, as leadership, you need to be continuously aware of to make sure that you have the right structure in place and the right motivation for people to continue to innovate. If you see any further questions, if you see, Christoph, in your, in your area, if you look at the end of the decade, what kind of innovations do you expect from telecommunications countries? What is the next big thing you can imagine at 2020? Well, actually, it might be a boring answer, but this is a quite continuous uh, development. You know, if in, at the end of the decade, this is 2020, I think we'll see a gigabit access society where people have a gigabit per second minimum, you know, in terms of broadband access at home. Imagine what that means um, in fixed line at least. We'll reach out to five to seven billion people with the internet, which is a tremendous change over that decade. You will see huge innovation on all the enabling technologies, starting from storage, where Werner is working, down to you know processes which are so capable of doing different things. So the foundation of everything will be just phenomenal. On that basis, I think the tech industry is firing on all cylinders. Not only in the tech industry like we perceive it here, you know, that is clear that in all the verticals we see disruptive innovation going forward in the old communication messaging segment with WhatsApp, Telegram and others, um, you know, disrupting. We've seen the video models just half an hour ago here, the new audio models and how that is going, going to play out. Local discovery, the disruption of industries like, you know, transportation and logistics. But also don't forget the old haptic industries. You know, we're moving forward to Davos a couple of days from here. We'll talk about Industry 4.0 and how that is going to play out. So I think uh, there will be fundamental uh, innovation everywhere. But what is very important that have, we have also, you know, the foundation in place of the ecosystem, the enabling technologies. And that's where we will be working on a lot. Okay, Werner, is there one big thing what you can imagine for Amazon in five years? <laughs> Do we get everything through drones? Uh, do we get an Amazon TV, uh, which is just very defined? Do we have glasses from Amazon? What's coming? What's a big innovation coming out? Yeah, as if I was going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you be, you'll be you surprised. We, we will certainly surprise you. I think on the technology side, on the AWS side, definitely, we're going to tackle, we're tackling one of the hardest problems there is, and that is simplification. Yeah, if you look at all of our systems become com complex over time, and I think uh, John Gall, the famous system researcher, said it well that, you know, complex systems that are built as complex systems will fail, always fail. Complex systems that are successful are the ones that are built out of simple building blocks. 
And so we're really looking towards how can we build technology components that make it really simple to build these highly secure, highly reliable systems that you would never be able to build be before. So simplification, for example, through serverless architectures with our Lambda infrastructure and things like that are definitely going to do some things that we will definitely double down on and make sure that people can start building these systems which are highly secure and reliable. Thank you very much. Big applause for our two panelists. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Like always a pleasure.